Globechain is the largest and fastest growing ESG reuse marketplace that helps companies become more sustainable, save money, and achieve their ESG and SDG targets. Globechain connects companies from the construction, retail, hospitality, and office sectors with nonprofits, small businesses, and people to redistribute unneeded items, reducing waste from going to landfill. From fixtures and fittings going to thrift stores and being upcycled by fashion students, to construction material being reused to help build schools, items are requested super quickly and help generate impact to local communities. So far, Globechain has diverted over 58 million kilograms of items from landfill, and they've helped over 50 million people across the world, saving them 350 million pounds through reuse. Check them out at globechain.com. What if current renewable wind solutions are not nearly as good as they appear? As it turns out, conventional wind turbines have many shortcomings from the point of view of the environment, human health, and efficiency. These were the opportunities that Chris and Cheryl Moore saw when they decided to create Harmony Turbines in order to revolutionize wind energy. Harmony Turbines look completely different. Rather than the standard turbine with three blades that you sometimes see dotting some landscapes, Chris and Cheryl's turbines have several, what can be best described as scoops that rotate horizontally rather than vertically. The other ingenious part of their turbines is their furling technology, which allows the turbine to continue generating electricity even in high winds when a conventional turbine is forced to stop running so it won't break. It's a fascinating technology with huge potential. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, Cheryl and Chris, thanks so much for joining the Sustainability Champions podcast. Great, great to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you. you for We're glad us. to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I love to start these uh, conversations with a bit of a big picture, just so we get an idea of who you are, what Harmony Turbines is all about, and what you do. So what's sort of the elevator pitch for Harmony Turbines? We are a small company developing wind turbines that finally make sense for the average homeowner. We're developing a product that is built from the ground up to be beautiful, to be convenient, to be easy to use and have features that make people happy to actually use it rather than regretting that they bought it a year later. And something that when their neighbors look at it, they'll be asking them where they got it from rather than informing them that they're filing an injunction against them. So we're trying to totally shift the way wind turbines and small wind are done in the world, starting you know in our local areas and building out from there um, you know, U.S., of course, and coastal areas, but then we look to be in the entire world by the end of, you know, a couple of years, hopefully. Amazing. And so when you say wind turbines that make sense, um, mm -hmm. when I picture a wind turbine, the only one that I know of, uh, sometimes people call them windmills, and I used to do that, but mm -hmm. basically three blades that spin in one direction and it sits on a huge pole. Right. And sometimes you see them in windy spots when you drive and things. Um, so what, what is different about Harmony Turbines and why do your turbines make sense? So the problem with those big, huge ones are that they're usually very ugly and very noisy. And people will actually, whole communities will get together and file lawsuits against the companies trying to bring them in because they don't want them in their area. They'll create... Uh, migraine headaches for people. They'll disrupt um, living in an area because of the flashing lights as those blades are constantly going past. We're always subject to and trapped by big business that's trying to make money. And so these companies are out there putting these massive things out there just for the purpose of sending you power through the line so that they can charge you for it. They're taking a free resource available to everyone on the planet and then charging you for it. What we're trying to do is shift that to where you at your home or at your small business are locally generating the power that you need, storing it in a battery bank or a capacitor bank, and then using it to offset your electric bill. Or if you have enough power generation in general between solar and wind, you don't even need to be connected to the grid. That would be perhaps 10 years from now, the 
you know, the evolution of where this needs to go as decentralized power becomes more and more a thing, but that's where we're headed with it. And that's why we were different in that regard, that it's not just about making power to charge people for it and maximizing power generation so that they can maximize money, money, money. It's about doing it conveniently, maybe not being the most efficient way that it could be done, but okay, fine. You put two or three of them up and now you've got the the amount of power that you need. Mm -hmm. So you have to rethink how to do it to make it convenient. I used the analogy before. You could ride a bike to work every day or you could drive your car to work every day. The bike is going to be way more friendly to the environment. You know, it's going to be cost effective and everything, but does it make sense? And so that's what we're getting into. You kind of pick the lesser of the two evils to help the world move forward in a better way. And that's what we're trying to do with Harmony, make something that finally makes sense so people can actually adopt it and be happy about it. So what if they're not maximizing, you know, getting absolute maximum efficiency out of it to, to reap every penny out of the, the product? In the end, if people aren't happy with it and people aren't embracing it, then it's going to fail. So even though they're making the money right now because of legislation allowing them to do it, these companies are ultimately going to fail and it needs to move to a decentralized model around the world. Hmm. And so, first of all, um, I never knew that the standard turbines are noisy. That's probably because I've only driven past them, like the really big ones. So that's <laughs> really surprising. Um, but second of all, what that the fact that you're using those the, the fact that you use the words ugly and noisy um, and the flashing lights to describe those uh, the standard turbines means that yours don't do that. They're not ugly, they're not noisy, and they don't make flashing lights. So how are yours uh, designed? So we're not looking to maximize, I just said five minutes ago, we're not looking to maximize the economy of these. So that means we're not going to be making 300 foot tall Harmony turbines. Okay. We will license the technology to companies looking to make larger versions, maybe put them out on the coast and stuff. But there really isn't a need to go that high. Yes, the higher you go, the better the wind. But again, it's not about money, money, money here, guys. Let's think about the environment. Let's think about the cost that right now is invisible to the rest of the world, or at least obfuscated to where we're ignoring it or not really seeing the cost until it's too late, until we've got all these monstrosities built. And then we're going, oh my God, why did we do this? Why did we allow this in our coastal area? We are trying to do it better from the ground up. So Harmony would be smaller units, closer to the ground, easier to deploy, quicker to set up, more redundancy, because now you have 10 small ones instead of one big one. If one right. goes down or something, boom, now you're only losing one tenth of your power instead of putting power out for an entire community. So it'll be smaller. It's pretty much silent in operation. It spins far slower than other ones because the whole geometry of it is different. So you don't get that strobing effect that hypnotic like uh you know seizure inducing effect of sitting there watching those those big turbines spin and yes those big ones are incredibly noisy people have referred to it's called infrasound or ultrasound it's like sonic vibrations coming from the whooshing the woof, 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 woof. Uh, constantly when you're anywhere near them they can hear it for like a mile away you can hear these noises they've done all kinds of studies about communities reporting greatly increased you know problems with all kinds of things with um visual and audio and just issues mm -hmm. when they're around these groups of large wind turbines and even we have gotten phone calls from people who use the smaller ones uh like in the boating communities and they talk about how you know the the turbines are right there on their boats right next to where they're trying to do life <laughs> and they're really noisy the the propeller type ones so um it's not just in the big wind farms it's the little ones too that are um seem to be annoying like that yeah they took the great big technology that's out there and they just shrunk it down thinking well heck, these big ones work so well, let's shrink it down and sell it to people. But they never really thought about it from the ground up. The people are calling us saying, Chris, I can't even have a conversation on the deck of my boat when it's normal wind, not even a storm, just normal wind. It's so doggone noisy that you can't even hear because those wow. things are like <laughs> making a noise kind of like a lawnmower as it's sitting there spinning. And 
if you ever see a storm coming up and watch those, I've been asking people to send me video of what their wind turbine does. We're waiting to get some good video of that. I'd love to have that to send out as a B-roll footage, but um, they're very, what I would call frenetic. They're like, and then they stop and then, and then they stop. So it's doing this on, off, on, off, on, off. I mean, that would just literally drive someone crazy for an eight hour thunderstorm, seeing their turbine doing that and hearing it doing that on, off, on, off. It would make you want to just, you know, jump over the side and swim back to shore. <laughs> it might be worth it. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to make a product that people can look at and go, there it is. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, it's a 35 mile an hour wind thunderstorm raging right now. And this beautiful little turbine is just sitting there. It's, you know, its diameter is reduced because it's furled partly in right now to control its speed, but it's working perfectly fine. And it's spinning nice and normally it's not out of control. It's not stopping and starting. That's the gold that we're going to finally start getting video footage of. And we're start going to start getting people that give us that feedback and send us those video clips and saying, here guys, this is what a wind turbine should look like in a 35 or 40 mile an hour windstorm or whatever, not this horrible, crazy thing over here. And that's going to be the kind of publicity or the kind of aha moment around the world where it's kind of like, you know, the shot that was heard around the world. It's going to be that kind of thing where people finally wake up and they go, Oh my God, yeah, that is how wind turbines should be. Where can I get one? Yeah. And so, so the difference between the standard turbine, which is a propeller basically, and harmony turbines is th there's a, a lot of differences, but a few key ones are, um, first of all, it's not a propeller at all. Um, it mm -hmm. kind of moves on a almost horizontal plane rather than a, a vertical one. And then also- it, You've got it backwards. Backwards, okay. Uh, they call it vertical axis because the shaft is vertical. Oh, or I see. The shaft gotcha. and the other one is horizontal. So the propeller shaft that it spins on is horizontal in those big ones. So I we understand. are a vertical axis wind turbine. Got it. And the standard turbines are horizontal. Horizontal axis. Wind axis. Turbines. Gotcha. Okay. So that's first of all, the direction in which the thing moves is completely different. And then right. also the ability, uh, and this is what blew me away the most, um, is the ability for it to work in basically any wind condition from like one mile an hour wind to or two one to two miles an hour to we haven't yet determined what the upper end is <laughs> yeah so and i want to put a caveat out there daniel one to two mile an hour we will begin spinning we'll okay. get the mass of the turbine moving we'll get get it rotating but there is no power in one and two mile an hour winds so Harmony isn't magic. We're not going to be making full power in one to two mile an hour wind. You're probably making only one to two percent of your power potential in very, very poor wind like that. Mm -hmm. But here's the difference. If you get that mass moving and get it spinning now, when it comes up to five and six mile per hour winds, now you could start producing a little bit of power at that stage and you're producing power sooner you're using the wind quicker than the other turbines the other turbines can't even get spinning until they're up in between six to eight mile an hour winds they just literally can't even start spinning and so, is that why they're the I, I would imagine you you said earlier that the higher you go the more wind there is is does that explain mm -hmm. why typically these turbines are so tall yes they're trying to maximize that free resource that you know, Mother Earth provides to them. Yeah, it's and the funny. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, the, go on. the funny thing about the the big ones is that um, they actually can't get started on their own. They're I don't know if you knew this, but they need kicker motors. A lot of them need kicker motors to like jumpstart them. I think all of them need kicker <laughs> motors. They're like Kubota diesel engines in the thing. You know, fifty horsepower motor just to get all that mass rotating and moving. People will talk about, well, they're only noisy when they're starting up. Why are they noisy when they're starting up? That's when they should be the absolute most quiet because the wind is the lowest when they're just starting up. Well, it's because they're using this great big, crazy diesel generating kicker. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, come on, people. That's crazy. Why, why would we make stuff like this and then slap a green, you know, green sustainable energy label on it and think it's cool? It's... I don't want to say it's a scam, but we are all being 
scammed in a different way. You know, it's like a scam right before your very eyes because we're just being led to believe this is the only way to do it. And it is not the only way to do it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I mean, I, I didn't know that I had no idea. And this is one of those situations where, yeah, these are the things that are, are not typically talked about. Everyone sees a wind turbine and thinks, beautiful green energy. I mean, anytime you see like a, a little graphic of what sustainability looks like, there's always solar panels and these turbines kind of littered on a, on a landscape and it looks so wonderful. Um, but as you're saying, there's always more to it. And that's, yeah, that's what I'm always learning. Take a, take a field trip sometime out to a wind turbine farm and just talk to people, hang out, get some footage, and you'll very quickly see it's not all that it's cracked up to be. And, um, you know, I guess we're trying to help demystify that. We're trying to help change that perception. Even, even the bird strike thing, you hear people freaking out. They'll swear at me. They'll yell at me online. And you're such a, you know, blah, 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 telling, telling us, you know, telling people, trying to scare people more birds are killed by cats every year than wind turbines. They use like stupid analogies like that. It's ridiculous. These big monsters out there are killing by the thousands and tens of thousands. I don't even know the numbers, but it's out there. The statistics are out there. They literally find it cheaper to just pay the fines on a monthly basis or quarterly basis for all the birds that they kill than try and fix the problem. Right. It's cheaper. It's all about money, money, money. Yeah, it's cheaper to just pay $10,000 per eagle that's killed or per you know California condor endangered species. The big soaring birds that have the huge wingspans and just soar gently around, they lumber into the area because those blades are moving so fast at the tip. There's nothing in front of them. Birds look forward and they look down when they're flying. They're not looking up above their shoulder to see what could come down and whack them on the head. And that's exactly how they're killed. Those blades come down and nail them right on top of their back or on top of their head, like literally in a half a second because it moves 150 feet in a half a second. Well, wow. that is, you know, the birds looking in front and it's totally clear, but a half second later, now it's literally getting hit by a Mack truck, that big, huge blade whacks it and it's dead, lights wow. out, you know, that's happening every single freaking day. And people are, it's, it's like, we don't, we're not even allowed to know the truth because there's footage. People will go out there and literally take their phones and cameras and be like, look at all these dead, huge, enormous birds laying at the base of these things. And when the companies catch them out there, they very quickly, you know, security's on the spot and they're shushing them out and everything. But yeah, it's don't be fooled when they say, oh, more birds are killed each year by cats. Yeah, how many eagles are killed by cats each year? How many eagles are killed by, you know, even on highways and stuff like that, come on. Yeah, there might be a few eagles killed, but no. Our huge soaring birds, our big, huge, majestic birds are being slaughtered by the thousands, tens of thousands, by these things and more and more because we're putting them in places those birds like to hunt and soar. Why? Yeah, you know? I, I don't want to... I need. I really need to double check this before I say it, but I've. I think I've heard somewhere where... Uh, some of the turbines are actually placed in areas where there's migrations, where birds migrate from north to south. I, I don't know if that's true or if you have any information about that. I don't have any information on that. Okay. But... Yeah. D not to be quoted on, but I may have read that <laughs> somewhere. But it, it, if you think about it, I mean, logically, it, it's not within the realm of the impossible because some of these areas, I would imagine birds travel where there is good wind uh, to yep. help them move. Right. And... So they don't have to work so hard. Exactly. And that's a good place for a wind turbine. Um, mm -hmm. Back to the decentralized power, because that's a, a big component of, I suppose, your philosophy or approach to Harmony Turbines. Um, decentralized power is very different than the way things currently work, where you pay, you know, there's a handful of large energy companies and you pay one of them to provide you power. Um, what is the benefit to the individual to go with decentralized power? So 30 years ago, you look like you're almost old enough to be able to remember the era before cell phones. Do you remember when it was just landlines and they were sort of introducing these crazy things called bag phones and suitcase phones and, you know, the richy rich people had a few of them. No, he's not that old. Okay, no. I'm old. <laughs> 
But uh, I've heard of that. I remember it. that era well. And if you would have come knocking on people's doors saying, hey, we're going to give you this thing and you're going to cut your lines to your house. You're going to cut your landlines. People would have been out there with a shotgun. You're going to do what? I'm sorry. You know, get off my property. Yeah. But that shift to decentralized telephone and phone communications has happened almost instantly overnight. When you think of how quickly that shift happened, it was probably within, I don't know, a 10 or 12 year span because one person had the foresight to come out with something that was convenient, easy to use and made sense. Yeah, the bag phone might have lasted three hours because the battery could be 20 pounds and you're toting it around in a suitcase, so they don't care how long. So maybe the battery lasted longer in a bag phone or a suitcase phone, or maybe it had better reception because you could pull the antenna all the way up five feet in the air. But was it convenient? Was it making sense? People were happy to give up a little of that performance for the convenience of what this was going to become. And when Samsung and Motorola and those guys began rolling out the ones that you could put them in your pocket, you could fold them up, boom, it was a paradigm shift. It was a change in the way people, they were like happy to say, sure, I don't care that I can't talk for 10 hours like I can on my landline because now I can hop in my car and be talking while I'm going and running errands or I can do things, I can get around or I can get other things done. I can be more efficient while I'm out running around and I'm at meetings or I'm on site with work or whatever, I can still get my phone calls. That type of thinking is what decentralized telecommunications did for that industry. And nobody even looks back and wishes with, oh, oh man, I, I would love to have my old landlines back. No, same thing is going to happen here. Decentralized power is going to allow us to separate from the grid, be autonomous. Literally, when you think of third world and developing countries, how they don't even have good infrastructure for power generation. As we begin to get a foothold in these locations and they have local power generation at their small community level or at their home level or village level, now you're able to provide the basic necessities of life for people. Put wind up, put solar up, put a you know a battery and capacitor bank up that you can store that power and now you've got the ability to be anywhere you just pick that little bubble up that little m m up and plunk them down anywhere in the world you could even we could even begin seeing installations where we're out on places in in the ocean like floating communities and things like that well the wind out in the ocean is tremendous i mean my gosh why would we want to ignore this renewable resource and people say oh you know fusion's going to be better and this and that but okay fine it's not here yet but wind is let's capitalize on it now let's make it smart make it sexy make it something that people want and we are like the smartphone to wind technology in a world of bag phones and suitcase phones and landlines going back to dirty wind uh because yep. i think this is a really this is probably you there's a few usps with harmony turbines but i think being able to capture um i think the way you call it is harvesting winds that other turbines miss mm -hmm. so we already talked about how harmony can start at one to two miles and by five to six it's actually mm -hmm. begins to generate a bit of energy um and we, you mentioned that it, there is no top end, but on your on your website you've described, and I've heard about it too. Once winds hit a certain level, turbines have to stop. Mm -hmm. So, basically, in a storm, a turbine like there's a an, a crazy amount of energy happening, and a turbine yep. can't do anything other than just hold on and pray that it doesn't topple over. <laughs> right. um, what happens in a storm with Harmony turbines? So you you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, why would you want to stop in the absolute best power that you've had all week? Why would you want to stop? I mean, that's like insane because one storm could make up for a whole week of crappy wind. Do you remember but in, um, have you seen Wally? Yeah. Do you remember that part where he's floating around and he's really close to the sun and he unfurls his um, solar panels and he charges in like, 
three seconds as opposed to <laughs> normally charging. It's it's kind of like that. Like, why would you want to stop if you're right next to the sun? Why would you want to not use your solar panels at that specific moment? Right, Daniel, you hit the nail on the head. And this is the world that we live in. People are like, oh yeah, I'm cool with it. It's it's a storm. We have to shut down. What are you talking about? No, make the technology so it can produce power, produce maximum power right on through it, just like Wally. I I have to admit, I I did watch the movie and loved it, but I can't remember that part it's of it, a, so I'll have to watch it again. It's such a small, that, it's like a three second. That is second. the perfect analogy for Harmony Turbines because we are going to be capitalizing on those moments. And yes, you may live in an area where you don't even have great wind, but if you get storms that come up on occasion a couple times a month, hey, you just, you know, you may end up finding that you're actually in a decent situation to have wind. I'm not going to, we're not going to be out there saying to people, oh yeah, everyone in the world can get our turbines and be happy. No, it's not magic. You need wind to make power. But in those cases where you have the strong storms coming up, as long as we do our work correctly, and we are still in the development stage. We're about to get into testing in all these cases and scenarios and putting them out at beta locations. And we're going to be gathering data. We're going to be finding out what works, tweaking and changing and reiterating. But that's the beauty of where we are at. We're not trying to get out there and sell a product before it's ready and then get the bad press because we didn't have something dialed in correctly or we didn't have a component built quite strong enough to withstand storms and things like that. We're going to have different models models for the cold and the icy and snowy climates that actually have resistive heating built into them to melt the snow off of the areas. We're going to have models that are okay for uh, tropical, like, not tsunami, um, typhoon areas. We've had people calling us saying, you know, can you make models that will work down in the Philippines and in the Japanese islands and stuff like that, where you've got these horribly strong winds. Well, yeah, we're probably going to have to soup up the, the components that are in it to withstand, you know, 100 mile an hour winds and stuff. But Daniel, can you imagine getting footage of the islands like being devastated? And here we've got these eight Harmony turbines, like, you know, dotting the coastline, just happily producing power right on through that event, providing life sustaining power, needed power to communities that everything else is letting them down and shut off and, you know, hiding you know, we're not going to be bulletproof. We're not going to be indestructible, but we can do it so much better than we are right now. I'm not in any way trying to say we're going to be able to withstand anything that mother nature can throw at us. No, but holy crap, come on. We can do a lot better than we are right now. Are you kidding me? We have to shut off in 40, 50 mile an hour winds. No, that's ridiculous. Um, so that's where we're trying to go. We're trying to be in that market where we can capture at the lower end. Yes, there's not a lot of power to be made at the lower end, but at the higher end where everyone else is shutting off, if we can capture that, that's huge. That's enormous. And that is life-changing. And and how do you capture it? the, it's, it's the, what you call the furling or an unfurling technology. So what, what is that tech? You want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, so this is one of the patents that he that he has mm -hmm. for Harmony Turbines. And it, the concept is that um, when the wind is lazy and gentle, the scoops or wings or people have come up with all kinds of names for these things. And we don't we, we call, call them scoops. scoops. <laughs> so the scoops are um, wide open so that we can catch as much air as possible. And uh, the concept is that we have some programming on board that is monitoring RPM. So, uh, you know, there will be a predetermined safe RPM range for that model, for that particular model. And so as, as Harmony is monitoring what's going on, you know, if we start getting into the higher range of RPMs, well, let's, let's close in the scoops a little bit. And it's hard to just talk about, you have to see it <laughs> uh, to really understand it. But as you close in the scoops a little bit, you start capturing less wind, but it helps control your RPMs. So this is where um, in the big storms where other turbines have to close down or not close down, but have to stop, um, we are closing our scoops to capture less wind, but we can still capture wind and we can still be controlled. So the patent controls 
it controls harmony. And yeah, the patent is about the technology right. which controls right. harmony. So, so we don't close down the whole way. We don't turn into a cylinder. We don't shut. We just close down maybe 10% or 15%. So it's constantly running in a loop and checking its RPMs. It's a very simple program. It'll be running on you know pick chips or PLCs later after we're out of development. Right now we're doing it on Arduino to help us you know, easily program and dial in the power curves and everything, but it's just going to be constantly checking its RPMs. And if it says, Ooh, I'm getting above my safe limit, pull in 5%. Now it checks and it says, okay, I'm good. Or maybe it still says, Nope, I'm still too high. Pull in another 5%. And at some point the resistance on your generator and the reduced capture area will cause an equilibrium. And now your RPMs will drop off to a safe level and it'll sit there at that RP at that you know, furling state running, which is still at maximum production. As the storm begins to die off, it'll open back up. So it's a very simple loop that it's going to be constantly running and checking its RPMs to maintain a safe RPM level. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And and I agree with you. It's I mean, as you're as you're describing it and and talking about it, I've seen the videos, so I understand and I'm visualizing it in my mind as you're 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 saying it. So I it's easy to to see, but without uh, if you haven't seen uh, how it works, it's kind of it's it's tricky to to think about because first of all, the um, the har harmony turbine looks completely different than a propeller. So you, you have to put, you know, for anyone who's listening and hasn't seen it or even watching this video and, and you know, you're not seeing any images or videos. Um, yeah, it's it's really difficult to, to imagine because you have to throw the propeller thing completely out of the window. Um, it, it has nothing to do with that. And then the scoops are, um, I mean, without without seeing a visual, it's kind of hard to describe, but they really are kind of like scoops um, and the way they're, sort of the wave uh movement that they that they right. create as they the spin helix. yeah mm -hmm. it's um it, i mean it looks amazing and i think w when i when i understood that and, and you have a really great little um you know couple two three minute or five minute video with the um with an with like a graphic explaining how it works it just it it what I love about Harmony Turbines is it's so simple to understand. Um, and to me, that's really the power of it. Um, no pun intended is that <laughs> it's um, the, the simplicity behind it just means like you, as you said at the very beginning, it just makes sense. Um, and mm -hmm. you're obviously um, taking care of a lot of the major challenges associated with the standard wind turbine and, um, you know, both on the on the bottom end and the top end, just from a wind generation perspective or energy generation perspective, but also then, of course, there's all the co-benefits, shall we mm -hmm. say, of protecting wildlife and helping helping people as well from a from a health standpoint. Um, I'm really curious to know how did you come up with this idea? Where did this come from? <laughs> I'm a, a strong believer in the fact that we are not the first inhabitants on this planet. And, you know, life didn't just spring up here by accident. I think uh, there were civilizations here long before us. And so the yin and the yang symbol, something that has literally been around so long, nobody knows where that symbol became a thing, where mm -hmm. it was first drawn. There's theories, you know, that it came out of China or Asia or whatever. But I said, all right you know, being a, a believer in other civilizations being here long ago, I thought, what would ancient, you know, men or women, what would they have been looking at if they didn't have time to sit there and just draw artwork because they were too busy worrying about where I'm getting my food and my water from? They were all the old symbols and hieroglyphs and stuff like that, I believe, are things that people looked at and observed in the actual world around them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what would they have been looking at that would have been a yin and a yang symbol. And all they did was took it and drew that symbol from something they were seeing. They didn't like dream up this beautiful symbol. I thought, what would they have been looking at? And it hit me that that symbol is a wind turbine in a closed down state. So in my mind, I opened that symbol up. And if you think about, you know, a turbine that's a hundred feet tall, you know, again, we're not looking to make harmony thousands of feet tall or 300 feet tall, but you know, 50, 100 feet tall, still 
a beautifully powerful unit able to make many kilowatts of power for a community in certain areas. But here you are, a little dude who's going out to gather your food and go hunt for the day. And you look up because this turbine above you is closed up in maintenance mode or something. You know, they're, they have it closed up to do something to it. And it is a perfect yin and yang symbol when you're looking at it from the bottom up or top down, you see a yin and yang symbol. And then oddly, when you open it up, if you're looking at it from the top down or the bottom up, um, this is a little bit more risque to talk about, but the the swastika was adopted by, you know, a, a very horrible group of people, the Nazis, but it far, far, that symbol went back way, way, way before they ever grabbed hold of it and turned it into something that we see as evil. That symbol was just as old as the yin and yang symbol. Take a look at harmony from the top down or the bottom up when it's fully opened. Hello. It looks just like that symbol. Yeah. It's, so um, that symbol is also used, I believe, in Hinduism. Yeah. I think people were seeing these wind turbines right in front of their very eyes. You know, they're on the ground looking up at it when it's either open and it looks very much like that symbol. I don't know what the real name of it is. Um, and when it's totally closed, it looks like a yin and yang symbol. Hmm. So that's kind of where I got the idea from. I was like, holy crap, they were looking at wind turbines. And so I didn't, in my mind, I never invented harmony. I'm just re discovering or re deploying technology that was here tens of thousands of years ago, a hundred thousand years ago, you know. And you said that you're currently doing um, your testing and, and you're, you're going to be sending out uh, the turbines into beta locations and you're mm -hmm. still developing the technology. So what is the future plan? And, and also, of course, your crowdfunding. Right. We are crowdfunding right now to get us through the next push that we need to, because we need to be able to pay our salaries to keep doing this. I can't do this in my spare time anymore. It's just ridiculous to try and do something as big as Harmony in the evenings and on the weekends. It, it'll kill me. And so much so that we had to both quit our jobs and now we work 100% at Harmony. We used to both work at the hospital and we were in IT for you know 30 some years. It's where we met and everything. Wow. But we are now 100%, both of us, Harmony Turbines employees. So we need to be able to pay our salaries. We need to be able to do the R&D. We need to buy resources and materials and equipment to keep pushing it forward and to move it forward quickly that is why we're doing the crowdfunding because it's not free to do this stuff. You can't just, you know, uh, sorry, the world doesn't work that way. You need money to keep going and to 100%. pay your bills and to pay your mortgage. So the crowdfunding is helping us to push through the final year of R and D because we're so very close. We're um, trying to finish up the first two MVP minimum viable product prototypes. One is for Bucknell university. The other is for us so that we can take that unit deploy it and test it and maybe even we'll make a little rig to put it on the back of our uh, truck or trailer and take it to locations to try it and test it we'll take it back we'll rip parts off we'll change parts we'll tweak it and fix what we don't like and keep what we do like it's iterative testing iterative development the way development should be we're taking the time to do it right rather than rushing and just starting to throw some piece of trash out there and, and say, here world, go ahead and buy this. And it's, no, it's not fully tested, but we want you to buy it anyway, I mean, come on. So that's why it's taking a while. People are angry at us because it's taking so long. They're like, when are you gonna be done? But we're trying to do it right, sorry, you know. And we, you know, to that effect, we often, well, we, not often, but we always uh, turn down, we've been turning down pre-orders for these because we don't feel like we are quite there yet no we're <laughs> to not be able to take pre-orders we still we are still researching so um but the demand is out there we're we're getting slammed yeah <laughs> with emails and phone calls you know people asking for this but we just a dozen we times don't a day feel good about it yet and so this uh the crowdfunding campaign that we have open is to get us further into the testing get some beta units out there, start gathering data. And we're working with Penn State, Berks and um, Bucknell University because they're working on projects with us to also gather data. And we are hoping that in a year, by the end of 2023, 
we will be able to start taking pre-orders and we will be able to start low volume production. And that puts us in a revenue situation where, you know, then we can start functioning that way, but we have to do the campaign right now because we're pre-revenue. We just, mm -hmm. um, we can't take pre-orders and use that money to, to still research. It, it doesn't sit right. Right. So. Yeah. So we're giving away equity in the company right now to help us, further our development because we have no other way to make money. I I do not feel uh, from a moral standpoint that it would be right to start taking money from people for our product when we're still developing it, when we're still working out the bugs, when we still have a lot of work ahead of us. So this crowdfunding campaign is to get us through the next 12 months where we are really looking at our technology, tweaking it, trying to come up with the first kit that we deliver to the public and we say, here we go. We're happy with this. We're happy with the performance. It might not be perfect, but we've got a lot of the bugs worked out of it. Here we go, guys. You know, now you can put in your orders for these units and make it simple enough that we in a small shop situation can produce several hundred of these a month, what I would call low volume production. So we're trying to get that kit put together and understand all the aspects of it, just like an Ikea kit, you know, you Ikea develops all the pieces and parts for this kit and then they send it out. Well, people aren't going to have to put together their Harmony turbine, but we have to get that kit all developed. And there's a lot of parts in it. You know, there's a lot of parts. Yeah. You know, it's not Literally. just a simple <laughs> little wind turbine. You're like, oh, there's only, there's like, I don't know, 85 or 90 different components in the thing and they all need to fit together really well and perfectly. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. Well, it's really, first of all, it's very exciting and uh, it's great to see, I was taking a look at the crowdfunding campaign and some of your updates, and it seems like people are really uh, excited about it as well, because the numbers just keep going up and, and it seems like they're going up in relatively short order as well. Um, but I, I, I think I, I would, based on what you're saying, I agree with you. It, you know, to take uh, pre-order money for something that you're not even sure 100% if it's what they're paying for is what you're going to be able to deliver. Because if you're still tweaking, I mean, you may discover yeah. in, a, in a month or two, actually, you know, we just found a way better way to do this. And it means we have to scrap like, yes, right. A quarter, We've had to quarter. do that twice. There you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so yeah. all of a sudden they've paid for something that doesn't <clears> even look, it's not even the, what they paid yep. for because you just found a way to improve it and you've had to throw half the thing away. And yes. now it's like 10 times better. Yeah but it's not what they bought. Um, right. right. It's, it's really how development should be done. Yeah. The world at large has gotten away from that because they're all about money, money, money. Just give us this and you know we'll worry about the the fallout later for things we didn't properly test. Mm. You know, It happens with our, our phones all the time. We get updates pushed to us that are horrendous because it wasn't tested properly. Yeah. We don't want to do that. You know, We don't want to be jumping the gun. We want to do it right. We want to get a good product out there, but... You know, it's a fine line. You don't want to take so long that now you lose all of the momentum, you lose interest. Other people come out with more superior things because they kind of take your idea and morph it into something else. So we need to be the first to market with our technology, with our generator and our furling technology. So we're pushing really hard to do that. And the only way to do that is crowdfunding right now. We need a lot of money. You know, our goal right now is, uh, I think we're allowed to say our goal and the minimum investment. Uh, you have know, to go we're, to we're really limited in what yeah we we're say. limited in what we can say but please go to our crowdfunding site you can you know see the terms out there are the minimum investment is two hundred dollars we are allowed to say that so people can get in and become part owner in harmony for just as little as two hundred dollars if they want but as they go up in their investments they get better and better um bonuses added on mm -hmm. so yeah it's we're trying to get to a comfortable number where we can actually do the work that we need to get a few extra people, uh, an engineer who can be helping me do the cam and a full-time machinist so that we can be banging through parts much quicker. We're a skeleton crew right now. And we have enough money from our crowdfunding campaign right now to continue as a skeleton crew for about a year. But okay, I don't want to be a skeleton crew for the next year. Let's get enough that we can actually now start throwing some of the dollars at the things to help us move quicker and more efficiently and do it the right way and so that would be that would look like um hiring some people with specific skill sets that will make things go faster for us um maybe 
getting some newer equipment so we're not fixing our current equipment as much. <laughs> um, maybe getting some additional equipment that will allow us to make parts more efficient, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's he's managing to do some really amazing stuff with the equipment we have. <laughs> quite frankly, it's quite old equipment, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it takes time to when you have old equipment and um, when you don't quite have the right equipment he's managing, but it just takes time. So the the crowdfunding raise, as you said, we have enough to move forward a year, just the two of us and, and a helper here and there, um, but we could go so much faster. And so that's why our goal is set higher uh, because we think we can get to lower vol or low volume production much quicker if we can hire some people and get some better equipment. And I want to, on top of what she said, people have really, over the past year or two, it's kind of dropped off. I think people see our vision was correct from the get-go, but we got some really, really strong opposition in the beginning. Oh my gosh, why did you go and build a machine shop and get that equipment and all that stuff? We got that because we knew we were going to have to iterate. We were going to have to change. And if you go out to any machine shop right now and you say, hey, I need these components, we need like 85 components. Can you imagine how long it would take to get all those machined at different places? And then, oh, crap, we screwed up. We need to, okay, we need to redo parts three, four, and five. And they're like, yeah, okay, well, you know, we have a 16-week wait, you know, lead time on this stuff. And we're like, yeah, sorry, we screwed up. So we would have burned through all of the money, all of the time, so quickly that we would be bankrupt a year ago. We built our shop so that we could do it for the cost of the raw materials. Mm -hmm. And for the past year, we were doing it kind of in our spare time. And as we had funding available to do it, and I had to kind of go back to work a little bit other at another place to pay the bills and then come back and work on Harmony when we had more funding. But now it's like, okay, guys, now we're in the final sprint. Let's slam it. Let's do this the right way. I'm there full time. My wife is there full time. We have enough money for a helper to come in and help, you know, clean and organize and do things. Now let's get a little bit more talent, as my wife just said, to finally help us get over the finish line quickly, efficiently and do it as a full team effort. You know, build out beyond the skeleton crew would be the, the dream here over the next year. I mean, I think it makes perfect sense that this, you know, to fund uh, the operation and to get the right equipment to get the right people. Um, it, it's, it's the way that it's certainly the way it, it, it works in Silicon Valley. I mean, people raise, you know, tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars in order to do this. Uh, so yeah. there's absolutely nothing outrageous or crazy about what you're doing uh, with your crowdfunding campaign. And, yeah, we're and nowhere near that number. <laughs> not yet. Uh, maybe, maybe no. soon. Um, but I, I think, you know, from the <clears throat> point of view of getting uh, what's cool about crowdfunding is that the people that you um, are aiming this product at and and who you want to um, buy it from you eventually and actually create a decentralized power system. They're the ones who are are excited, I would imagine, and and wanting to contribute anyway. So for them, they're they're probably thrilled to to be a part of it, to have a little piece of Harmony Turbine ownership and and contribute towards something that that they're very passionate about. So um, for anyone who wants to check out Harmony Turbines and contribute to the crowdfunding campaign, where should they go? What is there? A, what, what's the website? We're on Start Engine. So they would go to www.startengine.com and they can just search for Harmony Turbines right there. Or we can put the link if, if you would put the link in the video or mm -hmm. in the description, but it's basically startengine.com slash harmony and then a minus sign turbines. So, you know, you just go to Start Engine, look for Harmony Turbines and they'll find us there. And, Excellent. Uh, we also have the link on our website. Yep, so the link is on our landing page. Our website is harmonyturbines.com and we have the link right there on the front page to go to the campaign. We also have a really good, um, like a pitch deck and an executive summary on our website in the top right corner. If you download the pitch deck and executive summary, it goes into a lot of detail on our patents, on where we're going, on our financial situation, what we're looking to do with the money, where we're looking to be in 2023 and 2024. So a lot of really good R&D and links that people can click on and take a deep dive into the tech behind Harmony right there from our pitch deck. So. It's all Amazing. on our harmonyturbines.com landing page. 
Excellent. Plus what, 120 videos that we've got, 125. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was about to say that the the website's really worth visiting <clears throat> because there's just there it's packed full of information and the videos. I, I love that you have videos because like like we were saying earlier, you really have to see how the turbines work to understand and appreciate the technology. And you thankfully have a lot of information and and well a lot of video videos showing that, which um, just makes it easy to understand and the whole thing. Like you've been saying, it just makes sense. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Cheryl and Chris, thank you so much both for your time and and for for going through all this and for sharing your vision and the technology uh, with me <clears> today. <throat> it's um, it's fascinating, and I, I really wish you the best of luck with the crowdfunding campaign and ultimately with building this out uh, over the coming years. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for your interest and and your support. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Globechain is the largest and fastest growing ESG reuse marketplace that helps companies become more sustainable, save money, and achieve their ESG and SDG targets. Globechain connects companies from the construction, retail, hospitality, and office sectors with nonprofits, small businesses, and people to redistribute unneeded items, reducing waste from going to landfill. From fixtures and fittings going to thrift stores and being upcycled by fashion students to construction material being reused to help build schools, items are requested super quickly and help generate impact to local communities. So far, Globechain has diverted over 58 million kilograms of items from landfill, and they've helped over 50 million people across the world, saving them 350 million pounds through reuse. Check them out at globechain.com.